One of the things that draws people to the idea of personal knowledge management or PKM is that they want to discover these hidden connections between their notes and ideas so they can gain more inspiration and make it easier to be creative. But just dumping your notes into an app like Obsidian won't get you the productivity payoff that you're looking for. Trust me, I've made this mistake myself. And in this video, I wanna share a key mental model you really need to understand if you really wanna make more of your notes and ideas. Now let's start by briefly talking about what Nick Milo calls a map of content. And I credit him because I first heard this term when I attended his Linking Your Thinking workshop back in cohort three. And I highly recommend that workshop. If you have a chance, definitely go through it. But in one of the live sessions, Nick mentioned that a map of content is kind of like a workbench for developing your ideas. And that really resonated with me. I was intrigued by this idea of working with my ideas in a temporary space where I could take them apart and put them back together again in an effort to discover what I really had to work with. Now, around the same time, I also read the book, The Great Mental Models, volume one by Shane Parrish and Rhiannon Bauben. And this is a great book, which looks at several mental models, which are basically lenses for looking at the world so you can figure out how to make better sense of things. Now, nothing in this book is completely original. And in fact, several of the mental models like Occam's razor, which is basically the belief that the simplest solution is the best solution, I was already familiar with from other places. But there was one mental model in particular that really resonated with me and which complemented what I was learning in the Linking Your Thinking workshop extremely well. That mental model was the map is not the territory. You see, when you're looking at a map, you're looking at a visual recreation of the territory that it represents. But any map that you're looking at, by definition, cannot actually be the territory because to be the territory would require a one-to-one -one recreation of the actual territory. So in other words, the map would be as big as the territory it's supposed to represent and would be, in fact, completely useless. So the inherent limitation with maps is that they can't show you everything which leads to another limitation when it comes to map making. Any map you're looking at can never be perfectly accurate. All maps are in some way technically wrong, just like mental models. Let's go back to that Occam's razor example. The simplest solution is in fact not always the best solution. There are instances when that mental model should not be used, but you need to experiment and figure out when and where these models and maps are most useful. So the fact that they're wrong in some way, that doesn't mean they can't be useful. Just don't mistake your knowledge of the map for knowledge of the actual territory. So what happens when we look at a map is we look at what the map maker has determined is important for us to know about the territory. For things like driving directions, this is pretty straightforward. We need to know the street names, major landmarks, etc. We can all agree what's important enough to appear on that map. But the map is nonetheless an opinionated representation of what the map maker or the cartographer has decided is important for us to know. So every map reflects the values, standards, and limitations of their creators. And this led to the big aha moment for me. If I'm gonna lean into this role of the cartographer or map maker, and I'm gonna create these maps of content for things that I wanna better understand, then I am free to choose what I want to be on that map. And that means that one, I get to decide what's valuable and what's not, a concept I touched briefly on in my last video on taking book notes, and that two, any map that I make doesn't need to be perfect, it just needs to be useful. So because I'm making the map for myself, I'm free to change it and update it at any time, which is important when you're thinking about creating and using mental maps as you try to navigate your thinking about a particular concept. For example, what does a mental map or a map of content around the topic of habits look like? Well, you could try and collect every fact, statistic, and piece of information about the topic that Google can find, but if you did that, I don't think you'd actually be any closer to figuring out what all that information about habits really means for you. It wouldn't give you any practical value. So the trick here is that you need to have an opinion. You can't just absorb all this information. You can't collect it and assume that you now have an understanding of the territory. Remember, the book you're reading, the video you're watching, the podcast you're listening to, it's simply a map that the author or the creator made as they attempted to make sense of things for themselves. 
Consider the cartographer, do your best to understand the map, but then you have to decide for yourself what you'd change and what you'd keep if you really want to make it your own. And this is a mistake that I made for a long time when reading books, because I believed that I just needed to find the right book with the right information, and then things would break free, the revelation would come, the heavens would open, and it would all make sense. I assumed it was the right book and the system it contained that was gonna unlock things for me. I needed to find the right guide, the right guru, who could show me the way. But when you realize that all cartographers are limited and all the maps they make are broken in some way, it kinda destroys that fantasy. That's actually a good thing though, because I've found that the real key to inspiration and breakthrough comes from working with the ideas I've collected and asking myself, what does this mean to me? So in other words, it's not the book that unlocks things. It's the ideas contained in the books that fit together with the other ideas that I've collected when I take the time to examine them on my mental workbench. Every time I read a book, I have an opportunity to update my map and make it even better. And it's when I embrace the role of the map maker myself and I decide what's worth keeping and what should be gotten rid of that I get those aha moments. Now, reading lots of books certainly helps with this. In my last video, I walked through my whole note-taking workflow when I read books and talked a little bit about Mortimer Adler's four levels of reading. If you wanna know more about the philosophy behind taking better book notes, go watch that video. But the takeaway here is the idea of syntopical reading, where you're comparing the information from the book you're reading against all the other books that you've read and all the other ideas you've collected. And this is where personal knowledge management or PKM comes in. This is where we're gonna make the connections between the notes and we're gonna get the insights, but it doesn't happen without having an opinion. There's something magical about getting done with the book and forcing yourself to write an opinion note on what you think about what you just read. It's the act of trying to figure this out that brings the breakthrough. The minute that you try to codify your thoughts on a topic, number one, you'll realize how many questions you really have about it. And number two, you'll gain clarity that you couldn't get just by thinking about it. There's an old saying I like that thoughts disentangle themselves through lips and pencil tips. But I would add to that also clicky keyboards. Every single time that I force myself to write an opinion note, I get clarity. So what does it look like to create a map of content? How do you actually work with your ideas on the workbench? And how do you connect ideas from different books and authors to figure out what is important to you about this particular topic? Well, let me walk you through an example by sharing a map of content that I created in Obsidian as I was trying to figure out my thoughts on the topic of habits. So at the top, I've got the reason for this MOC existing. It's a simple sentence saying that the goal of this MOC is to codify my thoughts on the topic of habits. Next, I've got a visual from the book, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, which explains the habit loop. There's a cue which triggers a routine, which gives us a reward, and then this reinforces the loop. Now below this, you'll see an opinion note that came to me as I was reading this book for the first time. This has never really sat well for me. So then I've got a call out here on what my problem is with this model which is that as soon as the cue is triggered, the routine happens automatically. I would like to think that I have some choice in the matter and I'm not going to automatically engage with that routine. So then I read Atomic Habits by James Clear. This next section talks about James Clear's method on the four laws of behavior change, which I actually like a lot better. Now the four laws of behavior change is actually its own atomic note. I've got a separate video which talks about the value and the power of atomic notes in Obsidian. But this basically shows that there is a cue, then there's a craving before the routine and the reward. And I like with James's model, this craving piece that's been added. It means that I have a choice on whether I'm going to actually follow through with that routine. And this is really important. I think we have to exercise agency. We have to assume responsibility for our choices if we want to have the power to change them. So next I read Tiny Habits by B.J. Fogg and was introduced to the B.J. Fogg behavioral model. This again is a separate atomic note, but the gist of this is that there is a formula here on whether we give in to that craving or not. That is the behavior, and it's determined by our motivation to do or avoid the activity, our ability to do or avoid the activity, and the prompt that is used to trigger the craving. So here's another visual which shows where the prompts will succeed or fail. 
based on how motivated we are to take the action and how hard the action is to do. Now I like this model because it shows me what levers I can pull in order to craft my own habits and routines. If I want to create a habit, I can decrease the ability required to trigger that habit, or I can increase the motivation. And this works in reverse if we want to break a bad habit. We can decrease the motivation or increase the friction, making the action harder. So now this is all starting to come together, but I've also got a couple of additional resources listed here. All of the books that I mentioned above, the New Year Focus Calendar, which has a built-in habit tracker, the best habit tracking app for iOS. This is an article that I wrote a while back for the suite setup that I reference frequently. And then Polar Habits is an interesting web app that I came across by Jesse J. Anderson, which kind of goes against this don't break the chain idea. Now, I also use Obsidian for my own sermon sketch notes. I basically built my own cross-reference library. And in order for that to work, I've had to break apart the entire Bible into individual notes for individual verses. So the next thing that you see here are a whole bunch of Bible verses about habits. Now, some people may argue that I should create a whole separate vault for this, but I actually like the ability to connect dots across different domains. So I've chosen to keep them all in my main vault here in Obsidian, and this allows me to bring in these individual verses. These are all their own atomic notes. Now these are all transcluded and all of these links appear in the local graph down in the lower right corner. And in addition to the verses themselves, I've interjected a couple of opinion notes along the way here as to why I think these connect. So hopefully by walking through that map of content, you can start to see how you might put one together for yourself. But the next question is, what do I make an MOC about? Well, anything that you are feeling even a little bit anxious about is a good place to start. Anxiousness usually comes from not knowing about something and creating an MOC is a great way to figure it out for yourself. And by the way, it doesn't have to be learning about a topic. You could also create an MOC or map of content when you're trying to make a decision. I've found the act of writing things out often helps bring clarity as to what the right course of action is. Now, you don't have to use Obsidian for all of this, although I believe it's the perfect tool for this. The important thing is that the next time you're feeling some stress about something, you recognize that that is likely coming from a lack of clarity. So create a new note and start to write down what you think about things. If you're like me, you'll be amazed of the clarity that can come from spending just 10 to 15 minutes in that map maker mode. Now, obviously MOCs can come in a lot of shapes and sizes, but I've found that having a few clarifying questions to get you started can be a big help. So I've actually created an MOC template file and added it to my Obsidian University Starter Vault. You can download the Obsidian University Starter Vault by going to obsidianuniversity.com vault. And it also includes a bunch of templates, tips, and additional resources to help you get more out of your notes and ideas in Obsidian.